How are you doing with all this solitary confinement? Because it really does feel like that, doesn't it? And certainly as you get older, you kind of take it a little bit more seriously. But you do miss routines, don't you? You do miss friends. And, you know, something you used to do every day on a Tuesday or on a Friday afternoon suddenly isn't there anymore. I'm sure it's all very character for me, but it's actually rather irritating. Anyway, in the meantime, let's get on to the next podcast. I've had a lot of questions saying, how did you arrive at what you did and why did you write the book, The Horns? Well, I mentioned earlier on that it was very much prompted by my meeting with Dumiso de Bengue, but that deserves a whole podcast on its own. So let me just give you some of the follow-up things that happened after that meeting. And funnily enough, I came across a piece that I had had to write for something I've forgotten about now, but also trying to explain why I had done it. So let me just read this to you. I heard that King Lobengula dressed in European clothes and rode a horse. Really? I found that Dr. Jemison was made an Induna of the Imbezu Regiment. Why? Why didn't we learn about it? Why didn't white learn about black and black learn about white? Wouldn't that have brought some greater understanding between us? Or was there just too much happening outside our borders of God's own country? And that would ultimately ride roughshod over the hopes of both of us anyway. I found out plenty about the historical altars of expediency. More important, I found out, history distorts truth. Lies usurp fact. Vested interests become the devil's work and are propagated and fed until they're believed. Whether they come from the pens or mouths of playboy concession hunters or manipulative politicians, their aims are the same. I wanted to try and do something about that by presenting all sides of an argument and letting you make the decision bit idealistic, but I, I think we're somewhere there. Because until we understand each other, we undermine each other. We hate from an orchestrated fear, and yet we actually long to be one, united in an all-embracing purpose for tomorrow's Zimbabwe. Before Zimbabwe's independence, before UDI, before even the Federation, there was a golden moment and we missed it. You'll hear about that later too. But it was very sad that that happened, because it shouldn't have happened. So how was I going to tell the history of the country in a way that was lively enough to make you want to read it and hear it? And get away from historian speak and dull bits that we've all read and kind of haven't really absorbed. So I thought, okay, here we go. Because of my playmates when I was very young, it was just waiting to be written. So this next episode will give you a bit of an idea of why I use accents. In fact, I really settled myself with a bunch of them. Oh, Scott? a wee Scot who plays a really important part in the whole thing, and then a wonderful Irishman called Aidan, as well as three Amande Bele boys. And I had to differentiate them too. So sometimes my accents, I'm sure, are execrable, but I hope they add a little bit of colour to everything that you're hearing. In podcast two, I talked about the traditional circumcision that Janu Jabu had opted for. It goes on because part of that circumcision he had to blood his spear and prove his bravery. Well, he decided he was going to kill a leopard. He had no dogs, he just had the short ikla spear of the Zulu stabbing spear. That was all. And he had a young Mfan with him too. If the Mfan was killed, he would be in big trouble. So it was a pretty impetuous thing to do. Let me tell you how it, it goes along. Hey, boy! There was a shout behind him. Where do you think you're going? 
Jeru stopped in alarm. No shouting, please, no shouting. This is my farm. If you want work, you take off all that Matabili warrior stuff and I'll pay you two shillings to herd my cattle. Jabu stood tall and turned to face the farmer behind him. He knew him, but the farmer did not recognise him. Now he was a man. Quietly, he said, Today I do not herd cattle. Well, then you bloody well don't walk on my land. I don't want you stirring up trouble. Jabu boiled with humiliation. You wait, Tertius Engelbrecht. One day you will not speak to me like that. But it was not yet time. Excuse me, Gos, he fawned. The leopard is taking your young sheep. I am here to catch him. You? Catch him with your ikwa? And no dogs? You're joking, man. You need to think about getting some proper work to pay your hut tax. Don't mess about hunting leopards. Go on, futzak. That hated word. Futzak. The Dutchman in South Africa used it with a snarl and it said, Get out, you useless person. Jabu stood tall and looked straight at Tertius Engelbrecht. Their eyes locked. Then he deliberately turned and moved away. But he didn't leave. He had to blood his spear with this leopard. He walked along the edge of the thick bush as though he was leaving, but he circled back so he could find a good place to see and wait for the leopard to settle again and sleep with his stomach full of young sheep. He waited and he waited. He couldn't see him. The sun was high now, and at the sound of voices, Leopard had moved into the deeper bush. He waited, watched. A tiny flick of tail and Jabu saw Leopard again, hidden in the dark leaves of a bigger tree, lying with a very full belly. Suddenly, Leopard lifted his head, golden eyes wide and staring. He wasn't moving, his eyes were fixed. This was not good. He should be sleeping with so much sheep in his stomach. Jabu had crept closer, but now he stopped. He dared not breathe. The time was near, but the eyes were too bright. He felt his heart shake inside him and he bit his teeth to get strength. Leopard was still watching something over there. Then the thunder cracked. Umfan screamed, Duma! Duma! Jabu saw Leopard jerk and the brightness of his eye faded. Gradually, it slipped out of the tree like a falling sheet of cloth. Jabu watched, transfixed. Then he heard a laugh. So much for the killing of your leopard, boy. This leopard has been killing my sheep for many months. Your spear would never have killed that young animal. It was too big and too strong. It would have killed you easily. I saw you come here, so I followed with my gun. Jabu dropped his head. Thank you, Bas. But inside he burned. He was close to bloodying his spear and marking his shield. This Engelbrecht had stolen his honour and his anger wanted to choke him. There are good and bad on every side of the fence. But you can see how if I just read that as a reading, it wouldn't have anything like the impact that it does in just introducing a bit of an accent there. It would be so lovely if we were all nice people, but we're not. It doesn't matter whether we're black, white, green, blue, pink, yellow. There are good and bad in every possible sphere. So what I've tried to do is to just look at the irritation points for everybody and how they reacted to them. And also how I introduced the four participants to talk to each other. And this particular one is, is a, a delightful episode. Poor old King Lobangula, he had been so pestered by so many people that the one thing he focused on was Queen Victoria. She was the great white English queen. She operated at his level. People, the Germans particularly, started telling him that she was a figment 
of everyone's imagination. He didn't want to have that. So he asked a man called Mound if he would take two of his Ndunas to see the Queen Victoria, the great white queen. Mound sort of tutted and said, oh, well, yes, yeah, yes, of course I will. No, no, no. Give, me, give me a couple of months and let me set it all up. They will be waiting tomorrow morning. And there they were, dressed in their full Matabele finery. It's a wonderful story. I won't tell you all of it, but here it is as it goes on. This was the final day. Now, they had been treated to banquets at Windsor. It was quite extraordinary what had happened. So it had been a mind-blowing experience. And one of the wonderful moments was they were taught about a telephone. One of them went miles away, and the other one went over here, and they dialed each other, and they were absolutely stunned. And when somebody asked them, and said, well, what did you think of the telephone? Babayan said, well, I can quite understand that the telephone would speak English, but how it learned to speak Sindebele as well, I will never know. So wonderful little gems like that had come mainly out of these missionary writings, but also a couple of the explorers who, I guess, had a bit more truth in what they were saying. This particular one was a complete report on the, the two Indunas going to meet the Great White Queen. And this is what occurred on the last night. The envoys had their final meeting with Lord Knutsford, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, at the Colonial Office on the 26th of March. He presented each of them with a ram's horn snuff box mounted in silver and a large portrait of the Queen for King Lobengula. He also gave them a letter to take back to the king. It started off by saying, a king gives a stranger an ox, not his whole herd of cattle. Otherwise, what would other strangers arriving have to eat? The queen sends Lo Bengula a picture of herself to remind him of your message and that he may be assured that the queen wishes him peace and order in his country. The Queen thanks Lo Bengula for the kindness which, following the example of his father, he has shown to many Englishmen visiting and living in Matibililand. Before their departure for the long trip back to Africa the next morning, the envoys decided on an early night, while Mand went to the theatre. During the interval, he had a call from the hotel, requiring him to return urgently. Now you can picture it. Oxford Street perhaps, certainly a five-star magnificent hotel which was where they had been put up at the expense of the English government. Baba Yan had caused great consternation in the hotel lounge by searching stark naked for his snuff box which he had left behind. To make matters worse, the Induna couldn't find his snuffbox immediately, as it had fallen beneath a table, from where he proceeded to retrieve it on his hands and knees. The society ladies and gentlemen in the crowded lounge were stunned to silence. Oh, Begora, why oh, they give me back teeth to see the looks on those stuck-up English faces. Brilliant! They were doubled up with laughter imagining the pandemonium it would have caused in the cloistered gentility of a five-star London hotel, when the very upper-class patrons spied a naked African man crawling under the table. Most of them would never have even seen anybody dark-skinned, let alone naked. Chief Babayan would have had no idea of the panic he left behind him, Jabula. It must have been fantastic. And can you imagine what they'd have said had they been able to understand his parting comment, Angus continued. He returned to his room muttering that one of the ladies had helped herself to some of his snuff. This prompted another howl of laughter. Aidan turned round to Jabu and said, Tell you what, Jabu, I'd have shaken that man's hand, naked or not. It had been a thoroughly satisfactory conclusion to the evening. 
As they all went off to bed, Prune had another reason to be happy. He was writing Snuffbox in his notebook to remind him of Babayan and Mshete. He had added three new words to his memory bank, nefarious, obfuscation and scurrilous. Kind of summed up the whole day, really. So that just gives a bit of an idea of an interaction. But it there are many, many more of them, of course, and occasions when all four of them are talking about a certain thing. One of the things that created enormous dissension, of course, was the Rudd Concession. And so there were many aspects of that that could be looked at. And what really happened, and why was one person saying it was buried in an ant heap, when another one said they'd buried it under a mealy pip, and a third had said they'd carried it across the Botswana de desert anyway. So you had all these opinions from these four characters trying to arrive at some sort of conclusion for what on earth had happened. So it does bring it to life. And I hope you will forgive me for some of the execrable accents you might well happen. I shall be practising before we get there. But it was so exciting to find bits and pieces of research that I hadn't heard of. And I had learned pretty well from my father who was in African education and he used to talk about all sorts of aspects of the Matabili history in particular. So I did know what I thought. I knew it pretty well. I only knew half of it. And so winding in among the real events, some of them not sure but you'd come to a conclusion as to whether they were truth or not, I had to also overlay the stories of these characters. I overlaid those in fact and in fiction, because fortunately I knew them well enough to do that. And that's where we'll go for next week. Hope you've enjoyed it.